of you are ready to dig into Scripture this morning? That was not enough. How many of you are ready to dig into Scripture this morning? Awesome. All right. Turn with me, if you haven't already, to Jonah chapter 3. Jonah chapter 3. And I just want to tell you something. On the northwest side of Tucson in 1988 or 89 or so, there was no better point guard you could find than me. All right, little seven-year-old me uh, playing in the city league um, was hitting three-pointers when other kids couldn't hit layups. I was left-handed, still am left-handed, God help me. Um, And most kids on the court were right-handed. They didn't know how to guard their weak side, so I could get to the lane so quickly and easily. I was the best defender on the court. It didn't matter that I was short because we were all short in second grade, right? And so I was pouring in points and other teams would be like, can you make that kid sit for a while so that our team doesn't get like super dejected? And I was like, this is awesome, right? It was great. It didn't matter that I was three feet tall, you know. Um, So in fifth grade, my parents could see how serious I'd gotten about basketball and I was um, enjoying it. Grew up in a city with a great, thriving college basketball program and that coach hosted a basketball camp every summer. So my parents paid for me to go to that basketball camp where kids from all over the city and kids from all over the state, even kids from out of state, were coming to play ball for a week. Kids who were from fifth grade into high school trying to get recruited to play D1 ball um, were all there for a week. And we're spread out by ages. You don't know anybody. And you just play all week. Anybody ever been to a camp this serious before? You just play all week. All week. Jason, you know how it is. You get spread out. You're on a team of five, six, seven, maybe more, and you just play games all week long. Um, And it was fun. And here's what I learned right away. Being the best kid in my neighborhood city league didn't mean a thing. (laughs) Because there were kids at that camp that were a foot taller than me. And look, you can teach a lot of things on a basketball court, but you can't teach tall. It's impossible. There were kids who were so much faster than me. There were kids who did not have ADHD brains, and so they could pay attention when their coach told them what to do, and not everything on the court was just freewheeling fast and loose. And I learned pretty quickly, whew, okay, I've got some work to do. And during one of those games, um, our our team was uh, projected to be one of the better teams in our age bracket that week. And during one of those games, we had fallen behind to a team that we should have been just smoking. And we had fallen behind to them. And we were down by one shot. And somehow I picked off a pass, I think, with like five, three seconds left. And I have a wide open fast break. The other guys aren't even chasing me. And it's just me and the shot. Anybody ever been there? Maybe not in basketball, but maybe some other sport where like, this is my chance. You ever been there? No? All right. Well, here we go. I'm going to tell you about mine. So I'm, I'm on this fast break. Now, if you have played basketball at all, even in the basics, you know that when you shoot a layup, it is wise for you to like choose a side of the hoop to approach, right? Like if you're left-handed, maybe approach it on the left-hand side, right? And if you're right-handed, ah, maybe I'll approach it on the right-hand side. That makes sense. You want to keep the ball away from the defender who's probably going to be in the lane, right? So you if you're right-handed, you don't want to go to the left side and vice versa. You want to protect your strong hand. So me, with all of the experience, and I've been playing basketball my entire life, but in that moment, I am homesick. I am embarrassed I'm nervous everybody in the gym it feels like is watching this moment and I don't pick left or right that's that's for traditional people I ran straight down the middle right so I'm like oh man I gotta get a shot up right and I get there and I'm like ah ah and it's too late and all of a sudden I'm like under the hoop and just ding just throw it like under the hoop right Hits like the bottom of the rim, and time runs out. And I didn't know little fifth grade, 10 year old kids knew so many bad words. (laughs) But they all said them at me on my team as soon as that game ended. And I just stood there thinking, 
man, I want to go home. This stinks. Anybody ever had a nice, awesome public failure like that before? Ooh. Don't they feel awesome? That week stunk. But our team kept fighting. That was like on Tuesday or Wednesday, so really set the week off well. <laughs> we kept playing, and we kept playing, and we moved into this other bracket, um, like the loser's bracket, and, and we just keep playing and fighting. And during our last game of the week, like literally our last game of the week, probably for like fifth place or something like that, uh, we had a rematch with this team. Really good team. Uh, I mean, they weren't really good, but they, were, they had gotten better during the week and felt like we'd gotten worse. And so we get to the end of this game, and it's tied. And this game goes into overtime. And our league was a little bit different. They didn't want games to drag on forever. And so um, during this camp, all of our overtime games were next shot wins. So every offensive possession was intense. And, you know, like every kid is like, this is my shot. This is it. You know, uh, there was, it didn't feel like there was much strategy. We all just panicked until somebody scored. And then you're like, okay, now the game's over. So here we are. We're in, we're at the end of this game. And this kid who's guarding me is like half, uh, half again as tall as me, which wasn't hard to do at the time. Uh, it's not hard to do today um, to be that much taller than me. And I'm standing there. And I'm just stuck, and their defense feels really tight, and I'm like, I don't know what to do, and I'm thinking about the fact that I epically failed against this team the last time we played, and none of my guys are open. And look, if you have a kid who's learning how to play basketball, or if you are a kid in the room who's learning how to play basketball, some of the best offensive advice I can give you is this, move without the ball, amen? Amen. Move without the ball, kids. You got to get open if you want to get a pass, right? And so my team isn't moving, and I'm like, I got no options here. I got to shoot the ball. And this was not a layup, but I was way out uh, kind of near the three-point line. Tie game. If I miss this shot, maybe it's a fast break, and they win, and then my team gets to say more bad words in my direction. But in the moment, I didn't know what else to do, and I shot the ball, and it went in. I'm just kidding, it's super melodramatic for a really small moment in my life, but <laughs> somehow that shot went in, and these guys picked me up like I just won March Madness for them. These same kids who were literally cursing my name three days ago were going crazy because we won our last game, and it was silly, and it was funny, and in retrospect, uh, when I look back at that moment, what immediately comes to my mind is this idea. Sometimes... Sometimes, redemption means that God totally rearranges our stories and gives us new opportunities in new places. How many of you have experienced that kind of redemption in your life? Maybe one marriage failed, but you've got another marriage and God is redeeming that part of your life. Or maybe you epically lost a job, but God redeemed that in another way and you've got a different job in a new place or maybe a new town. Sometimes God's redemption means that he rearranges our stories and gives us new opportunities in new places. And sometimes, I would say even in pretty rare occasions, sometimes redemption means that we get a second chance to do it right, right where we started. And as we look at Jonah chapter 3, what we see is a guy who was stubborn and self-righteous, I would argue even prejudiced, he gets another chance. Jonah gets a second chance. God gives Jonah a second opportunity to get it right. And in Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, it starts like this. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. We've mentioned it every single week in this series, and we're going to be wrapping up this series very soon. But remember that Jonah's story is packed full of three major themes. If you remember, let's say them together, ready? Uh, there is grace and mission and redemption. Grace, the undeserved kindness of God. Everything that you and I have in this life uh, every good thing you and I have in this life is because of the grace of God. Yeah, 
Like, and and you, you can agree with me or not, but it's true. Every single good thing that happens in your life is undeserved kindness from the God who made you. We don't earn it. It's just because he loves us. So grace is all over the story in the book of Jonah. But then there's also mission, the purpose that God has for life, and redemption. And we've talked quite a bit about redemption in Jonah's story. And we can easily see where these have shown up so far. We see mission show up right away because there's God's heart for the broken. The broken people of Nineveh, lost people, even violent people, that's who God sends Jonah to. This mission that God has for Jonah is, is, is to reach people that are not anything like God's people. They're very dissimilar. The Assyrians, the people in Nineveh don't live any, any, anything even resembling the way that God has called his people to live. But Jonas, God is sending Jonah there with mission, his plan, his heart for broken people. And grace is all over this story because Jonah doesn't listen to that. Jonah doesn't embrace the mission. And he needs a lot of God's grace. And God's grace shows up in, in the middle of Jonah's disobedience. God sends difficulty for him. And if you remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. The difference between the storms God sends and the storms that the devil sends is every storm God sends in your life is constructing something in you. And every storm the devil sends is always about destructing causing havoc and destruction in your life. But God sends a storm for Jonah to build something in him. We know that because Jonah survived the storm. Amen? And uh, if God wanted to kill Jonah, he knew how to do it and knows how to do it. So Jonah survives this storm. And I want you to notice that the grace of God for Jonah shows up in disguise. For Jonah, the grace of God looked like an awful storm and then being swallowed by a large fish. And I want to encourage someone in the room this morning to just remember, God's grace doesn't always look the way that you expect it to look. It's always going to be for your good. It's always going to turn out well. His redemption is always going to produce in your life, but it doesn't always look the way we think it should look or expect it to look. Sometimes His grace is the end of a relationship. And I'm not, I'm not encouraging anyone to make any decisions uh, when I say that, but it's true. Sometimes there's grace in that. There's, or there's grace in the end of a job. But the truth about God's grace gets hammered home for us in Jonah's story because he did not deserve a second chance, but he did receive one. <clears throat> and redemption, I mean, it's all over. It's all over Jonah's story. He survives the fish. But then what begins to happen in Jonah chapter 3 is real redemption. He gets a second chance to obey God's call and be part of the mission to bring grace to the Assyrians. And it's in this calling that we see these themes come together, grace and mission and redemption. Because we, we've mentioned it a little bit, and I don't want to belabor the point, but there was a violent <clears throat> death culture that existed in Nineveh. A violent city. It was dangerous. Didn't compare to anything that you and I know of or maybe even see on the news today. I mean, we're talking... Deadly, <clears throat> almost cult-like worship of death in Nineveh. And God deeply cared about the people who lived in the middle of it. And we talked about this a few weeks ago, didn't we? About how the grace of God means that he loves people that you don't even know how he could love them. Right? Right? The grace of God in, you, in our lives, in our world, means that someone gets kindness from God that we don't think deserves it. And it has to work that way, because if they don't get grace, guess who else doesn't get grace? Me. You and me. And so God sends Jonah with a, with a message of warning, and even that message of warning is a gift of grace to these people who don't know God. And it's here that where we can say that Jonah's second chance only happens because he serves the God of second chances. And look, if we look through Scripture, there's plenty of people who get second chances from God. 
Adam and Eve, banished from Eden, right? They live in perfection. You and I live with aches and pains and temptations and issues in our lives because of those two people, right? And yet God has redemption for them. God doesn't abandon them. He preserves a special relationship with them. He looks out for them. They get a second chance. Abraham gets a second chance. If you are curious about the origins of everything that's going on in Israel and why Gaza and Lebanon and Hezbollah and all of these countries in about a thousand mile radius of Israel don't want them to exist, friend, understand it leads all the way back to Abraham and his son Ishmael. Abraham not trusting God's plan creates all sorts of havoc, and yet God still gives Abraham his son that he promised, a son named Isaac, a second chance. Moses thinks that God is going to have him uh, set Israel free from captivity in Egypt. He wants to do it his way, so he kills an Egyptian and winds up on the run for 40 years. But God doesn't abandon jo Moses. He has a plan for Moses and his and, 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 and his calling, and he gets a second chance to do it right, and God empowers him to do that. David is a huge example of someone who seems to get second and third and fourth and fifth chances with God because he does a whole lot of stuff wrong, and yet the Lord forgives and makes space for David and his story, even in the middle of his failure. And so right here, as we get into Jonah chapter 3, this is Jonah's second chance. Jonah has gone for the layup on his own and totally tanked it. And in Jonah chapter 3, he gets a second chance. Let's pray. Lord, we ask that your word would just do great things this morning as we open it. We know that the Holy Spirit is present with us as we dig in, and so we just ask, Lord, that you'd help us Lean in and hear your voice and respond in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's look to verse 3 together. It says, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. So at the end of Jonah chapter 2, Jonah has been vomited on the shore somewhere between Israel and Tarshish. That's a big chunk of the planet. We don't know where Jonah got tossed up. He might have been sitting on a beach in North Africa somewhere, covered in fish slime. Or maybe he was in Turkey, smelling awful, looking like he just sat in a fish for three days, right? Either way, wherever Jonah got vomited up on, he had a long journey back to the place where God's plan was. He's, he's walking, probably walking on foot to get to Nineveh. Nineveh wasn't a port city, so he had to take a journey somewhere to get to Nineveh. Nineveh sat on the Tigris River. Modern-day Nineveh, if you know about the Middle East at all, modern-day Nineveh would be kind of the eastern portion of the city of Mosul, Iraq. Iraq. Mosul is where there was some very intense fighting after September 11th uh, in the, in the, in the, as we invaded Iraq. I think it was in 2003. So this is a place that there's still people there today in that region of the world. Nineveh sitting right there on the eastern edge of modern-day Mosul. And so where Jonah landed isn't of huge consequence for us. The length of his journey doesn't really matter. What matters is that when he got a second chance, he obeyed. He went. Let's just pause at that fact for a moment because it carries a lot of weight for us. Jonah's first failure was massive. It threatened multiple lives nearly destroyed a ship. And after a miraculous survival story, I mean, Jonah had the story that was going to impress people at parties for the rest of his life. Right? You know, like, look, man, I was, I was in war. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I lived in a fish for three days, bro. You want me to tell you about that? And everybody else in the circle just quiets down, and they're like, yeah, we would really like to hear about that, right? Jonah had the, the story. He, God has, has given him the story. 
And after this massive failure in his life, I want to point out to you, there's so much value in this. Jonah just did the next thing that he could do. He just did the next right thing. See, I think what happens for you and I, if I can just kind of try to hit home with us a little bit here, what happens for you and I after we feel like we've really let God down is sometimes we can feel this internal pressure that we've got to go do something outlandish or impressive. Okay, God, I really messed that up. How can I double down and do something really good now? How can I, how can I kind of up the ante for myself? Okay, God, I really messed up, so I'm going to go fast for a week. Or starting tomorrow, I'm going to read the whole Bible this month, right? I'm just going to show you how, how much I can do this. So I'm going to sign up for 10 ministries at church because God knows JD's been talking about that, and I haven't been serving in any way, and now I messed up. Maybe I just need to serve in ministry, right? We try to... Pay God back somehow and do something outlandish. Can I just tell you, one of the best things you and I can do after we feel like we've messed something up in whatever way we've messed it up is just the next right thing. The next right thing. Not trying to completely rearrange our lives to prove something to God. Oftentimes our journey in spiritual growth involves you and I just doing the next right thing that we know from his word to do or the next thing that he puts in front of us. And one of the things that we should keep in mind is this. There's always something good on the other side of our obedience to God's voice. There's always something good on the other side of obedience to God's voice. So Jonah goes... And his ministry begins in Jonah chapter 3, verse 4, and it says this. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city. Remember, this city was a three-day walk to go from one end to the other. And he began by going a day's journey into the city and proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Now I want to jump ahead with you a little bit. Because we know from God's own words to Jonah in Jonah chapter 4, that Nineveh had over 120,000 people, God says, who do not know their right hand from their left. That's kind of a, a, a fancy way of God saying, these people don't know morality. There's 120,000 people in Nineveh that don't even know morality. They don't even understand the right from wrong thing to do. And there's almost universal agreement among historians that during the time of Jonah's ministry, which was like 700s BC, 750 BC or so, that Nineveh was literally the largest city on earth. Largest city on the planet. It was the center of commerce and religion and power. Nineveh was not just the New York City of Jonah's day. It was Beijing. It was Shanghai. It was Calcutta or Mumbai. It was one of the largest cities in ancient history. It was huge. The largest population center known to man in this prophet's lifetime. So when God tells him, I want you to go to a violent people that don't believe like you believe. I want you to leave your home and it's the biggest city on earth and you're not going to have a single friend there, but go and tell them that they're all doomed. This is a big tough calling for Jonah. And that's where God had sent him. To tell people who loved killing each other, hey guys, all of this is about to cave in here because you don't live the life that honors God. One man shows up and tells them that they're doomed. This is such a simple, I mean, this is simple, right? Imagine you and I get a calling from God tomorrow to go to Beijing and preach to go to Calcutta, to go to Rio de Janeiro, or even a smaller mega city like Mexico City or Moscow. What are you and I going to do? I'll tell you what I'm going to do. First, I'm going to freak out like Jonah did, right? But then I'm going to start cultivating a plan. And then, can I just tell you, how many planners do we have in the room? 
Like, like you are, you are like, you, you're the detail people. You hear an idea and you're like, great, but how's that going to happen? Anybody in here like that? Look, God bless you. We need you. People like me don't live and survive without you in our lives, right? But what's very, very interesting is the situation that Jonah's facing here and how he responds to it. Because God's sending him to that place. Biggest city on earth. Dangerous violent city and Jonah just goes he goes Jonah's been given from God everything that he needs now does it always work like that no it doesn't always work like that there's plenty of planning that happens throughout scripture and and I'm not making the case for you that you and I don't need to plan I'm simply saying that when God is in it listen I've got a lot of movement in the room if I can just get you to sit still with me for a few minutes I'd so appreciate that When God is in it, that's enough. The message is so simple. God tells Jonah, go to this city, walk through this city, say this thing to them, share the message. Don't soften it. There are times when ministry requires a lot of spirit-led strategy and dialogue and creativity and thoughtfulness. There's no question about that. But there are also sometimes moments just like this one where Jonah just had one job. Go share the message I already gave you. That's it. And God was going to do the rest. So Jonah spoke to Nineveh about who they are and where they were headed. And his message was not softened. He didn't say, hey guys, it'd be nice if you'd stop killing each other. Maybe just stop killing each other and God will be cool with that. No, he shows up and says, the whole place is going down unless you turn to God and change your ways. The message was straightforward because it was urgent for them. Maybe no one was going to respond. But that wasn't Jonah's concern. His job was to do what God asked him to do. And to say what God asked him to say. And what God did was amazing as a result. Jonah chapter 3 verse 5 says this. The Ninevites believed God. The Ninevites believed God. That's it. I mean look. Sometimes scripture fills in the details for us so well. We get almost word for word what Peter preaches on Pentecost Sunday in Acts. We get all sorts of amazing examples of rich detail that come from the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of John. Other times, God doesn't fill in a whole lot of gaps for us. So we have moved really quickly here. In Jonah chapter 3 verse 1, it says, God told him to go to Nineveh. And by Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, the whole city is believing Jonah's message. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. I want to break this down just real briefly with you. I want you to notice that when God's man shared God's message with God's anointing, that means God's special blessing on it, we see some things happen. First of all, there was a simplicity in the message. 40 more days. I mean, God even gives these people a timeline. 40 more days. In 40 more days, God is going to destruct this entire city. It's simple. Jonah doesn't have to figure it all out. Now, sometimes it takes, again, it takes a lot of strategy. But listen, you and I, sometimes we can get like paralysis by analysis. And we can think and think and overthink and overplan and overstudy when God is saying, look, J.D., why don't you just take a step and I'll show you that I'm in this. But you're going to have to step first. That's what faith is. The simplicity of the message. 40 more days and this city is going to be judged. The reaction to the message. The Ninevites believed God. And then the response to the message. A fast was proclaimed. And everyone put on sackcloth. These things come together. And the largest city on earth, listen, the largest city on earth turned in unison to a God they did not know, did not worship, and had not given any thought to before. 
This is the real miracle in the book of Jonah. Friend, could you imagine you and I going home, checking our phones, turning on the TV, and finding out that all 20 million people who live in the city of Beijing have become followers of Jesus because one man preached one sermon? That's what we're talking about in the book of Jonah. That kind of miracle. And verse 6 begins to drive the impact home. It says, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, that is probably like the governor, not necessarily the king of the nation, but the guy over that city. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Look, can I just tell you This is a weird moment. Sometimes weird stuff happens in the Bible, and I'm thankful for the weird stuff. Because this king, when he gets word of Jonah's message, he instantly has something written out that says, I don't want anybody eating anything. Don't you dare think about feeding your cattle, your dogs, your kitten, anything. Don't feed your children. We're all turning our hearts to the Lord. To a God they don't know. To a God they've never worshipped with sincerity. To the God Jonah speaks of. One message and all of a sudden they're ready to quit killing each other and turn toward him. Friend, are are you seeing the power of this moment? The whole city is changed. I want to point out some things here that are worth pointing out for us. First of all, everyone changed their clothes. Sackcloth and ashes. It's a weird expression. Sackcloth was a fabric that was usually made out of goat's hair. Goat's hair. It was thick. It was very coarse and extremely uncomfortable. Nobody was walking in the room being like, what do you think of my new sackcloth? Yeah, it looks pretty sweet, doesn't it? Got it online. Black Friday sale, right? Like, nobody was wearing sackcloth. It felt terrible. The point was that you wore something uncomfortable to remind you of your sorrow. Nothing that anybody wanted to wear if they could choose it. In fact, sackcloth, because it was so uncomfortable, is used throughout Scripture to illustrate people that are in mourning. So, a couple of examples of that. Genesis chapter 37, when Jacob finds out that Joseph is gone, and his sons have told him that Joseph is dead, he instantly changes his clothes, puts on sackcloth, and dumps ashes over his head. Esther chapter 4, verse 1, when Mordecai, a, a, a servant of God, Uh, finds out that there's a plan in the Persian government to exterminate all Jews, the first thing he does is change into sackcloth and dump ashes and dust on himself. The symbolism here is that sackcloth is showing, I am forcing myself to be uncomfortable. I'm showing that I'm upset about something in my life. I'm sad. I'm disappointed in myself. I'm embarrassed. I'm sinful. I messed up. Things aren't right. And the king says, everyone in this city, get into your sackcloth. All of us. Secondly, everyone fasted. The entire city stopped eating and drinking. And as we mentioned, this is kind of the weird moment. It's the animals too. When it came to sackcloth and fasting, everyone, both human and animal, were expected to participate. And now look, I just want to tell you, if you're feeling repentant, the answer is not to starve your dog, okay? (laughs) 
I want to point out to you that what's going on here is that God is just meeting these people where they're at. He's meeting these people where they're at. He doesn't expect them to understand that he's pursuing the souls of lost people. So if they want to make their cows fast, fine, go ahead, fine. There's no inherent righteousness in that. But God's just meeting these people where they're at. So everyone fasts. And then the city, uh, finally, the city is called to holiness. This is the greatest thing of what occurs uh, in Nineveh. It's not just a change of their clothes. They're not just backing away from the kitchen table. The ruler of Nineveh tells his people to give up violent living and pursue the presence of God. And I just want to point out for you here, there's no real repentance in your life unless you're pursuing the presence of God. In fact, Jesus talks about, in the Gospels, he talks about someone who's demon-possessed. And that maybe the demon gets cast out of them. But that person does not welcome the work of God into their lives. They're just happy that the demon is gone. Jesus describes it this way. He says, you know what winds up happening? Is that demon comes back with seven more demons and they take up residence in an empty house, describing this person's heart. They take up residence in an empty house and that person's worse off than they ever were before. You know why? It's not, it's not because the demons broke in. It's because they didn't choose to follow the God who stops the demons from showing up in the first place. Look, you and I can be brokenhearted about our sin all we want. We can wear sackcloth for the rest of our lives. We can starve ourselves to death. But if we're not turning toward God, if we're not pursuing the presence of God in our lives, we will inevitably turn back around to what we were and, 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 and those base passions in our lives. We're trying to meet our needs outside of God's word. It's not just about outward holiness. Are you getting the message here? How tragic it would have been if the, if the ruler of Nineveh said, all right, guys, this God's coming to get us. You know what the gods want. Put on sackcloth, quit eating, and let's just see what happens. No, he gets the message and realizes we need repentance. Friend, you need repentance. I need repentance. If we're going to see God change our lives, it's not just outward holiness. That's never, never been the thing. It's pursuing the presence of God. Without that, nothing was going to change inside of them. Verse 10 spells out their, the city's response a little bit more. It says, or God's response. It says, when God saw what they did, this is such a good lesson for us. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Look, I think there are people in our lives, and we've been teaching this um, in America for a long time, and it's dangerous. There are people who teach things like, um, I remember having a conversation with a, a friend of mine that I worked with in college and him saying, you know, I just grew up in a church that said, if I believe, that's enough. I just grew up in a church that, that taught me that if I believe, that's enough, and I'm good with that. Can I just be delicate in saying it's not? It's not. What I mean by that is this. If I, have, if I claim to have a belief, and, and, and the book of James absolutely spells this out for us. If I claim to have a belief, but that belief does not affect the way that I live, then the conclusion is I don't really believe it. So if I, be, if I say I believe it, but it's not changing anything about who I am, the conclusion is not all I need is belief. The conclusion is you don't really believe in the first place. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, that's repentance. Literally, the New Testament word we use for repentance means to change your mind, to turn around, to change direction. Yes, we need to believe in the God of forgiveness. Yes, we need to believe in the God of the cross. My question to you is, okay, you say you believe. Show me how the belief is making the difference. If you can't, 
then my suggestion is maybe you don't believe like you say you do. And I'm being very gentle when I say this, but look, it's the truth. You and I can't just say we believe. That's the hardest part about this. As a husband, I can't say I believe in forgiveness. I have to have it. As a dad, I can't say I believe in investing in my kids. I have to invest in my kids. As a pastor, I can't say that I believe in the value of God's word. I have to know it and read it and love it. I can't say that prayer matters. I need to model that prayer matters. Look, at some point, what I believe has to find wheels that are touching the pavement of my life and pushing me in that direction. Otherwise, I don't really believe it. And you don't either. If it's not changing your life, friend. God describes Jonah, actually, is very likely the one who recorded this book. He describes this short, uh, in very few words, a very amazing miracle. That the largest city on earth all became lovers of God in an instant. We talked at the outset of how this story of Jonah is filled with miracles. God speaking to Jonah, God sending the storm, God swallowing Jonah with a fish. Uh, It's incredible stuff. But the greatest miracle we get in the book of Jonah is what happens in the city of Nineveh. I mean, look, we're in a town of 7,000 people. And there are people who come in this room every single week stone-faced to what God is wanting to say to them. But Jonah sets foot in the largest city on earth and preaches one message, and the whole city says, yeah, we'll do that thing. It's a miracle. Amen? Amen. A city known for its violence. A city known for worshiping other gods. It's the greatest miracle we see in this book. And I want to let the message of this book settle in our hearts for a moment because all of us are like Jonah. All of us have checkered pasts. All of us have moments where the layup was right in front of us Just don't do that thing. It's easy. Or just do that thing that God has put right in front of you. It's easy. All of us have had those easy moments in our lives that we totally threw away. We've all done it. Those moments where we could have been the hero, but we messed it up. We tanked the decisions. We wasted years. We missed opportunities. We broke stuff. So did Jonah. That's what I love about his story is that God uses what went wrong in Jonah's past to bring about something right in Jonah's future. So stick with me for a few more minutes because this is where we're landing this, okay? God used what went wrong in Jonah's past to bring about something right in Jonah's future. Let me put it another way. What God has done for you is a reflection of what God wants to do through you. After he was thrown up on the shore by a fish, Jonah was the perfect man to go to Nineveh with God's message. You want to know why? Because the God of the Ninevites was an ancient idol named Dagon. He was the God of the Philistines, and the people of Nineveh held him in high esteem. And Dagon was a mermaid. Merman, sure. Dagon was a merman. Half fish, half human. A man who ruled the seas. That was his kingdom. And Jonah comes along with a message from God and a story. (laughs) A story of how he conquered their king's territory with God's help. Are you catching what's going on here? The biggest failure in Jonah's life becomes the tool in God's hand for the biggest miracle he could ever orchestrate in Jonah's life. 
Are you catching that? If Jonah doesn't run, if Jonah isn't swallowed by the fish, he doesn't get vomited up into this city and show up and say, guys, I've got a story. And by the way, I've lived in the world of Dagon and it's the God of Israel who brought me out of it. I've been in the world where you say Dagon rules, and my God totally conquered that dude and tossed me out of the fish so I could come and tell you that my God is greater. Amen. So take a moment and think about your worst failure. The one. The mistake that you look back on and think, I wish I could just grab that back. I wish I could delete that. Wish I'd never done that, said that, thought that, reacted that way, whatever it is. Just pick one. And understand that the God you serve is so full of grace and redemption that he would take that thing and make it the strongest tool in your life for his work. That's the kindness of God for you. That what should be the worst day of Jonah's life, and by far it had to be, because inside of a fish, forget it, right? Winds up being the strongest tool that God can put in his life as he stands in front of people that worship a false idol that looks just like that, and he can say, guys, I beat him. With God's help, I overcame. With God's help, Dagon didn't win. I defeated that guy. Jonah's story of failure and weakness became the tool that God would use to reach the Ninevites with power. See, Jonah knew what it was like to experience the undeserved grace of God firsthand. Firsthand. He knew what it was like to have grace from God. He was living the redeemed life. If anyone could believe that God would turn things around for Nineveh, it was Jonah. And listen, in fact, as we wrap this series up in a couple of weeks, one of the things that you're going to see is that one of the reasons why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh is because he knew God would do something like this. He didn't want to see Nineveh get saved. He didn't want to see Nineveh get redeemed. But in this moment, Jonah sees God do a miracle. So my question is, what has God done in your life, friend? Because what he's done in your life is pointing you to how he wants to work through your life. Have you been set free from substance abuse addiction? Have you watched God carry you through a divorce? Have you seen God heal your body? Have you watched God redeem some awful decisions in your life? Those are the parts of your story that he wants to use to point you towards mission. Remember, we say it a lot around here that God doesn't waste anything. And he doesn't. No one believes God can rescue an addict like an addict who's been rescued. No one knows that God can comfort you like someone who's been comforted in their tragic loss. Amen. No one knows that God has a purpose for you even when your marriage ends like someone who's lost their marriage. No one knows that God can come through like someone who's experienced his healing power. Friend, all I'm asking you to do in this moment is to look at your life and look at your story and ask yourself this question. What might God want to say to someone else through what I've been rescued from? Your story speaks volumes. I, I, I've, we've talked about it before, but one of my favorite examples of that is when Jesus casts a bunch of demons out of a guy on the far side of the Sea of Galilee where all these non-Jews live. And the guy's like, can I come follow you? And Jesus says, no, stay here. He's the only guy, by the way, that would even talk to Jesus. The rest of the community tells Jesus after they see him work that miracle, they say, get out of here. Please leave. We're begging you. Just go away from us. Jesus leaves. When he comes back, 
It says that the shore is, people are waiting for him. And they are running, they're emptying the city. All these people who, the last time they saw him, begged him to leave. Now they're begging him to stay and heal them. And what's the difference? The guy who'd been demon possessed went back and told his story. And it changed everyone's opinion about Jesus. Jesus himself was not going to change their minds. But someone Jesus had touched, God was going to use him to change their minds. Amen. And there are people in your life, friend, we, I've said this before too, they could come here with you to church and I'm going to put them to sleep. And they're not going to relate to my story and they're not going to be impressed by me or maybe somebody else on our team but when you tell them what God has done in you, their ears perk up and they pay attention because they know you. And your story has credibility with them. Jonah shows up in a city where there, were, there, there are images of this guy all over town. Merman, Dagon. False god, false idol. And Jonah knows right away the story he can tell that's going to touch lives. And it's his. All you've got to do, friend, is connect the person of Jesus to your story, and God will use that. All you've got to do is tell someone what Jesus has done in your life, and he will use that. You don't got to be a pastor, you don't got to have a degree. You don't got to have all the answers. Look, nobody can argue with your story. We live in a culture where, where your story is king. Nobody can tell you that God didn't do something in your life. Look, lean into that. You don't have to have all the answers. Sometimes it helps to have some. Look, I love to study, and you should too, I think. But the reality is, if you have nothing else, what you do have is, this is what God did for me. This is what God did in me. Jonah got grace, and then he became a vessel of grace. Jonah experienced redemption, and then he was the tool to bring redemption. Jonah was on mission with God, and then the city of Nineveh winds up being on mission with God. What God has done in you, he wants to do through you. That's what we're saying this morning. There's so much activity that happens in this guy's life, and it happens at just a really fast rate. Jonah transforms, and then Nineveh transforms I just want you to notice that Nineveh was reached because Jonah was reached. Nineveh was transformed and changed because Jonah was changed. And when you and I see God changing us, I think the best thing we can do is embrace the truth that someone else is going to get changed because of what he's doing in me. I mean, this guy's story is wild. Jonah's experience in Nineveh reminds us that there's room in God's circle for violent, angry, hopeless, godless, idol-creating, idol-worshipping people. Because Nineveh wound up getting the same exact grace that Jonah did. This is beautiful. A Jewish prophet gets grace, and so do Assyrian killers. And it's the same thing for you. And Jesus, you get grace and then you give grace. You speak about your redemption and somebody else gets redeemed. You live on mission and then you see that mission begin to play out in your life. Jesus did not do something in you so that it will stop with you. And the work he's wanting to do in your life is not supposed to stop with you. We live in a culture where we're very comfortable saying, look, man, this is what I believe. This is what I believe. If you don't believe that, that's okay. Maybe your thing will work too. Look, the Bible um, doesn't teach anything like that. Yeah. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. If people don't believe that, there's no other way that's going to work for them. So your story is the way that they get introduced to the way. And you telling it 
is a great way of the redemption that he wants, is a great way for his redemption to show up in somebody's life. I want you to close your eyes with me this morning. And I just want to cut straight to the point with some of you because I believe um, some of us are definitely running from the work of God in our lives. Just like Jonah did. Uh, We're running from what God wants to do in us. What he's asked us to do, maybe we're running from The fact that he loves us like nobody else loves us. I can't speak for you and I won't won't try to. On any, any given Sunday morning in church, someone is here that's running from the Lord. So I just want to tell you this morning, friend, uh, you can't outrun God. And I'm so thankful for that. We can't outrun him. The best thing you and I can do is to lean into him. To talk to him. To fall apart to him. To bring him the very mess that we feel like keeps us far away from him. I feel like there are others here that just um, have a tendency to live in what was and not what can be. In fact, the devil knows. that he can't win in the end. He knows God's word so powerfully. He knows he can't win in the end. One of his best efforts in your life and in my life is if he can get us to live in our yesterdays, it makes it very hard for us to live for Jesus in the now. And I just think there are some of us here this morning that your yesterday is so loud, it's hard for you to hear the voice of God today saying, I love you, I can redeem that, I can give purpose to that, I can forgive that, you're not too far, it's not too late. And God is inviting us to hand him our yesterdays and watch him do something great with it. Within a few days of Jonah being vomited up on the shore somewhere, he is seeing one of the most amazing revivals in all of human history happen. God gives redemption to us, even our worst mistakes. So I know it feels like maybe I'm trying to dig in on you, here, and and that's not necessarily, I'm not trying to get an emotional response from you, friend, but I am really trying to drive this point home to you. There's nothing in your story that God doesn't know how to forgive and give purpose to. It doesn't mean you have to stand up someday in front of someone and tell the worst thing you've ever done. I'm not suggesting that. I'm just simply saying God hasn't abandoned you in your failures. He hasn't forgotten you. He wants to give purpose to those things, maybe a purpose that you can't even imagine. So if you're here this morning and this is the conversation the Holy Spirit's having with you, and you say, man, I've been running from God. Or maybe you say, man, my past just feels like it keeps running after me. Or you say, man, I'm, I'm looking for, to see God redeem some of my struggles and I haven't seen any of that redemption yet. All I see right now is my life just feels like it's messed up and I don't know what to do about it. 
and I'm somewhere between leaving my failure and seeing the fruit from leaving my failure and this is hard. Wherever you're at this morning, if I'm talking to you, I just want you to raise your hand with me. Anybody else? There's hands coming up. You're not alone. Anybody else? All right, hand raisers, stand up. Stand up. Prayer team, I want you to come and and just meet me up here around the front if you can. Come on, hand raisers. Come on. There you go. If this is you and you raised your hand, or if this is you and you didn't raise your hand and you should have, I want you to just begin to come. Come on, this is it. This is the moment that God has for you, I believe. So, I mean, this is the moment where God wants to set us free from some stuff, where God wants to help us get a clear mind on some things, where God wants to help our forgiveness feel sure. Come on, come right over here, guys. Come on, come on. There you go, yeah. God wants to do something new and powerful in your life, through your life. Can we just... Let's just begin to talk to the Lord. God, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are never done calling us. We thank you, God, that you are never done. That as long as there's breath in our lungs, redemption and forgiveness is possible, that a, a turning of our story is possible. Lord, thank you, God, that even the most violent and corrupt culture of its day in the biggest city on earth in an instant could turn their hearts toward you. God, if that's true, then we're not too far gone. We are not lost. So I just pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that the Holy Spirit would begin to tune our ears to your voice in a powerful way, that we would respond to what you're saying to us. God, some of us, our past mistakes are so loud and the devil is having a heyday in our minds and with our emotions just telling us what a mess we are. God, I just pray right now that your truth would cut through the noise and that you would pour out grace and redemption on these situations and on these lives, on these families. Lord, I pray you'd give us perspective on some of our deepest pains, and our deepest failures. Would you give us perspective that you were there, you were in the middle of it, that you didn't abandon us, you haven't forgotten us, that you know how to use that. Holy Spirit, my prayer, God, for us as your people is that we would lean into you and find your grace and redemption there and find that your mission extends all the way to us in our mess, in our mistakes, and that we'd watch you give purpose to every struggle we've got. Lord, we thank you. We love you. We need your help. God, we need the renewal of our minds. We need the formation uh, of our hearts that only you can give, and we ask Uh, that you'd work the same miracle you did for Nineveh in our lives as we turn toward you. In Jesus' great name we ask it. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, We love that you're here, Reach Church. Uh, If you need prayer, please come up. We'd be so happy to pray with you and for you. Love for you to be here for our prayer meeting on Wednesday night. Uh, God bless you. We hope you have a great and awesome week. We'll see you uh, on Sunday.